So we were talking about conditions uh, under which we're guaranteed for the existence of Nash solutions. And the approach we were taking was eliminating uh, situations in which it might be the case that there is no Nash solution. So far, our discoveries were, first of all, uh, so uh, first of all, we assumed that we're working with subspaces of the Euclidean space. That is, the strategy sets of agents were restricted to subspaces of the Euclidean space. So we had SI subset of R K. And what we had to assume was SI for each I. So let me write it like this. SI is bounded. Okay. Because if it was not bounded, we had a very simple example where the best responses did not uh, intersect, okay? essentially intersected at infinity. So to avoid those cases, we required the set to be bounded. We had to have, as I is, we had to have the set closed because if it was not closed, then we could easily have cases with nice best responses that did not intersect in SI. Essentially, the example we had was they intersected at the boundary of SI, but the boundary was because when SI is not closed, the boundary would not be an element of SI. So putting those two together, because we're working with Euclidean spaces with the usual metric, usual topology, this implied SI is compact. So I'm just repeating what we said last lecture. Well, we used pictures last lecture. We're doing it more compactly this time. And then, uh, so we needed to have these if we had nice, continuous, best responses, OK? But to, for the best responses to behave nicely, we had to have conditions on uh, the numeric representation of the preferences. So last lecture, we had ui s minus i, which is a function from si to, uh, to r. Okay. We need this function to be continuous. Okay. Because if it was not continuous, then the best response, the player i might not have a best response. That is, the best response correspondence could be empty valued. But if it is continuous for any s minus i, so we had for any s minus i, okay, if it was continuous together with compactness, these two guarantees that the best response correspondence is uh, non-empty valued. There is a Agent I has the best response to every strategy profile of the opponents. But later on, we realized that this was not, again, uh, sufficient. What we had to have was actually continuity and overall space. So Because if it was not continuous with respect to x minus i, we had examples where the best response, even though it was non-empty valued, the best response could jump from one point to another. Okay? So those are the conditions that we required so far. Oh, we had one more thing I forgot. Uh, later on, we discovered that the strategy set should also be convex. So let me add that here. Okay. Again, whenever we talk about closeness, boundedness, we're talking about the Euclidean space with the usual metric. Whenever we're talking about convexity, algebraic properties, we're talking about the Euclidean space with the usual vector addition and scalar multiplication. Okay. So that's where we stop, right? Last lecture, these were what we discovered. If the set was not convex, we could easily have 
nice behaved best responses that did not intersect. If it was not compact, we could easily have best responses that did not intersect, and so on. So, last example, last condition we need. Yeah. So again, let me restrict the two player. So we have a nice compact set, convex compact set. So for every strategy of player two, player one has a best response. Okay. So that's the best response correspondence of player one. Okay. And this is the best response correspondence of player two. Okay? So they don't intersect. I claim that I can easily have a game where SI is convex bounded closed. Okay? All the conditions are satisfied. UI is continuous both in SI and in S minus I, still, I could have a picture like that. Let me illustrate that. Last year, we did the illustration a little differently this year. Okay. So, take a function like this. Okay. For a given s minus 2, let the function be like this. So as s2 changes, so for example, when s2 is a small value, the maximizer is at this point. Let's say 0 0.7. Okay. Now, what's going to happen is, well, it's a nice continuous function in s1. And I will show that I can extend this function to be a nice continuous function in s2 also. So I'd like you, because I can't draw things in three dimensions, I'm going to eliminate that with my hand. So I have two peaks. That's where it is. So the function comes, makes a peak, and then goes up. So we have a function like this. So that's the S1 axis. This is the S2 axis. As S2 changes, the function behavior changes in this manner. Okay. So everything behaving in a nice, continuous manner. Every condition here is satisfied. Okay. Every condition here is satisfied. As S2 increases, this point goes up. This point comes down in a continuous manner. That's why at some point I have two best responses. But the best response correspondence is not continuous. It has a gap in there. Hence, I can easily write a numeric representation of, for agent two where the best responses does not intersect. So what's the problem? What should I, what should we rule out? So it looks like we need more conditions. And it looks like this condition should be on the domain or the function or both. The function, right? The domain cannot get any nicer than this. Okay. So, anybody have an idea what restriction we should put on the function? So, as S2 changes, our function changes. So, it's the best response is 0 0.7, 0 0.7, 0 0.7. Now, both 0 0.7 and let's say this point is 0 0.2. Both 0 0.7 and 0 0.2 are best responses, but they're the only best responses. And then as we go, as S2 increases, now 0 0.2 is the only best response. What restrictions should we impose so that we don't have functions like this? Obviously, if we have functions like that, the we might not have Nash solutions. Yes, sir? Maybe we should say that UI should be concave or convex. Okay. What do you think about that? 
So convexity, would convexity solve the problem? Yeah. This, the, the second derivative, what about the second derivative? So here it's the second derivative is decreasing. Here it's increasing, it's decreasing. You mean that it should always be increasing or it should always be decreasing or something else? It should always be decreasing or increasing, which is the same as saying that, well, the function should be concave or convex. Would convexity solve the problem? Sorry? We have the set bounded and closed. The set is convex. Of course, if the set was not convex, talking about the function being convex or concave would not be meaningful. Okay? So by having the domain convex, we can talk about convexity and concavity and meaningful. Let me do you another animation. So this function is a convex function, right? The maximizer is at zero. And as S2 changes, we have the same problem, right? So the maximizer is 0, 0, 0. It's both 0 and 1. And then now it's only 1. So so uh, well, the way I did the animation was like this. and. As S2 changes, this part goes down, this part goes up, and I'm still in trouble. I have a best response, which looks like 0, 0 all the way, and then 1. So I can. So convexity, restricting convexity does not solve our problem. Yes, sir? One absolute, so yes, that could solve the problem. So if you can say that the best response correspondence should be single valued, okay? So one problem here is at one point there is two best responses, right? There's two maximizers. For one strategy of the player, there's two best responses, two maximizers. So your friend noticed that you know, we have two. That's causing a problem, so get rid of it. So how can you guarantee that there's only one? What kind of restrictions on functions? Sorry? Should be what? Monotonic, well, if it's monotonic in S1, it will not be very interesting because, you know, it will be either, you know, in this case, one I would either be the best response or zero. So, yes, that would work, but we don't want to put unnecessary restrictions. We want to have a theorem which is as general as possible. Yes, sir. Negative? Negative second derivative, which accounts for strict concavity of the function. So you can require that the function is strictly concave. If the function is strictly concave, it will have a unique, whenever it has a maximizer, it will be unique. Well, because the function is continuous in SI and SI is compact, there is a maximizer. So strict concavity will solve the problem, okay? But again, we want to have, yes sir. Strict concavity, by the way, strict concavity in S1, not in every variable, only S1. Yes. Um, so it will not be differentiable. So, so it means that if we require strict concavity, uh, triangle, what your friend is saying that, if we have a function like this, we're ruling out this, okay? So we're ruling out this. We're ruling out more than necessary, OK? 
Okay. So how can we relax the condition? Well, as your friend noticed, the problem is there is two best responses, two maximizers at some point. Okay. So your friend's suggestion is to make sure that it's only one. Well, there's another way to solve the problem. Where was the picture? Yeah. Okay. So it's not only two. The problem could also be eliminated by making sure that anything in between is also a maximizer. Okay. So, which means that if you have two maximizers, if you have two best responses, two distinct best responses, then you have infinitely many best responses to a given strategy of the other player. Okay. So one way is to do what your friend said. Make sure that there's only one so that we don't have any problems like this. Or make sure that whenever there's two, anything in between them also is also our best response. By the way, anything in between is again meaningful because our set is a convex set. Okay. So how can I make sure that whenever 0 0.2 is a maximizer, a best response, and 0 0.7 is a best response, anything between 0 0.2 and 0 0.7 is also a best response. Anybody remember a condition from Calculus or Matt Econ? which guarantees such situations? Quasi-concavity. Exactly, quasi-concavity. Okay. So this function is not. Uh, there might be those who don't know what quasi-concavity is. Are there? OK, so let me define what quasi-concavity is. OK, so um, I'll give the general definition. Let x be. Again, these work in general vector spaces, but I'm going to work with Euclidean spaces. Let x be a subset of the Euclidean, k-dimensional Euclidean space, which is yeah, convex set. By the way, I'm, every set we take should be non-empty for it to be interesting. So normally, I should write be a convex and non-empty set. I'm leaving that out. Okay be a convex set and and f a real valued function on x okay f is said to be quasi concave if and only if the following well there are several ways to write it. I'll write one of them now, and then maybe write the others later. If and only if, for any L in R, the set, uh, the set of all X in capital X, for which F takes a value greater or equal, uh, yeah, greater or equal to L, is a convex set. Okay. So let me illustrate to you. Let's give some examples. So a set like this, is it quasi-concave? Well, first of all, this function is a concave function, right? Well, if it's concave, just by looking at the name, it should also be quasi-concave. But let's do our check. Okay. So what do we do? We take an L, a level. That's why I use the letter L. Okay. And we look at the points in the domain for which f takes a value greater than l.
Okay, so that's this set. So, is this set a convex set? Yes, right? That's something that you should be able to answer. I mean, take any two points in this set, connect it with the line. The line also lies within this set. And that's true for any point, any pair of points in this set. So for this L, this set is a convex set. So what we do is we repeat this experiment for different values of L. So let me take another level, L prime. So the function takes values greater or equal to L prime in this set. So is that set a convex set? Again, yes. So we do that for every value L. Well, let's take L double prime. What is this set for L double prime? It's empty set. Well, empty set is trivially convex. Okay. So for every L, this set is a convex set. Hence, this function is quasi-concave. Okay. Actually, any concave function is also quasi-concave. So uh, it needs a proof, but it's not that hard. I'll leave that to you as an exercise to you. So let's look at another function. Huh. Okay. Uh, let me draw my line here. That's fine, right? So sorry about that. I didn't realize. So this function, it's a convex function. Is it quasi-concave? Well, we take a uh, level L, the points at which the function lies above this level is everything, R, which is a convex set. So this level passes the test. But then we take another level, L prime. So the points at which the function takes Values greater than L prime is this region, which is not a convex set, right? Take a point here, take a point here, connect them with a the line. The line does not lie within the set. So this is not, for L prime, this set is not a convex set. So this function is not quasi-concave. This function is not quasi-concave, okay? So far, so good? So far, so good? Any questions? OK, let me do one more example. OK, this function is also a convex function. So is it quasi-concave? So this is not a concave function. It's a convex function. So what do we do? We choose a level, L, and look at the region where the function takes a value greater than L. It's this set. Okay? It's a ray from this point on, which is a convex set. Okay? And if we keep doing this, for different levels, everything array from this point on, array, array, okay? So we see that these sets for NAL is a convex set. So this function is a convex function, which is also quasi-concave. Actually, yes, sir? This one is not. So this one is not. So uh, I didn't write it, but I said it. Not quasi concave. No, it's not, it's convex. And quasi. Okay. 
actually any increasing or decreasing any monotonic function from R to R is quasi concave. OK? So far, so good? OK? So this says this is just this. That's simple. We have bordered Hessians to test for it. But for us, this is enough. OK? Uh, OK? Any questions? Any questions? So by assuming quasi-concavity, we include every concave function. So we don't rule out what your friend suggested. We have strictly concave functions are quasi-concave. Concave functions are quasi-concave. And some convex functions are also quasi-concave. Okay? So that's a larger set. Okay? So the last restriction we put here is is quasi-concave. So in SI, okay, this function has only one variable, the height component. Okay. SI is the only variable. So we don't require it to be quasi-concave on the set of all strategy profiles. It should be quasi-concave on the strategy set of player I for each strategy profile of the opponents. OK? So far, so good? Any questions? OK. And actually, uh, that concludes. So if we restrict our attention to this set of games, games which satisfies these properties, we are guaranteed for the existence of a Nash solution. Question? Yes, sir. So for, are these? Are these strictly? So uh, well, let me write the theorem. Okay, let me write the theorem, and then I'll answer your question. Uh, well, actually, do I need to write it explicitly? But uh, let me write it. So Nash existence theorem. So I'll directly write numerical representations. Okay, so it should be the preferences should be such that it admits a numerical representation, which satisfies the following condition. Be such that for every i in i, S i is uh, well. This time I'll write it non-empty. If it's empty, it has no meaning for player I to be involved there. Convex and compact subset of an Euclidean okay. So each SI could be a subset of a different Euclidean space. So maybe agent one selects a single number, agent three selects three numbers. So his strategy set is a subset of R3. Agent three selects two numbers, so his strategy set is a subset of R2. So each of them can have a strategy set which is a subset of a different Euclidean space. So non-empty convex compass set. And for each i in n, ui from s to r is continuous. And quite continuous in both variables, so and quasi concave. 
So let yeah, okay. Then the Nash solution. The set of Nash solutions of gamma is not empty. Okay. So to your friend's question, this is an if-then statement. So these are sufficient conditions, but they are not necessary. We've easily seen examples. For example, the Bertrand duopoly. Okay. The strategy set was not compact. Even if we compactified them, restricted the strategy set of players to some region from zero to maybe alpha or from zero to CI. The numeric representations were not continuous, but still there was a Nash equilibrium. Take the prisoner's dilemma game. The strategy sets are not subsets of a Euclidean space. Still we had Nash solutions, okay? So, yes. Uh, oh, oh, I'm sorry, yes, I should have written that. Quasi-concave in SI. Uh, well, let me, let me write it in two steps. Is continuous, and for every I in N, so thank you for reminding me that. Reminding me that. Ui, S minus I, which is a function from SI to R, is quasi-concave. Thank you. So it should only be quasi-concave in SI. Thanks. You don't have to check quasi-concavity in the whole space. Then then the game definitely has at least one Nash solution. OK? Any questions? Any questions? So oh. that's it. These are the conditions which guarantees the existence of Nash solutions. Of course, we could have easily have games, which we already had some, which some of these conditions are violated. Still, the game had Nash solutions. OK? Uh, should we do a proof? No? Yes? <laughs> okay. Uh, well, the proof, there are different ways to prove it. Uh, but the ones that I know of relies on things called fixed point theorems, okay? So I'll state one fixed point theorem. Kakutani's uh, fixed point theorem. Okay, so that's what we're on. Uh, use in the proof. So uh, let S be uh, non-empty. Again, I shouldn't have to write that, but let's write it for now. Non-empty, compact, and closed subset of an Euclidean space. So it's a subset of RK for some natural number K. Okay. Let F from S to S. Okay. So this is not this time it's not from S to R. By the way, S here doesn't have to be strategy profiles. It's any subset of the Euclidean space. Let S uh, from S to S be uh, not well. 
Yep. Oh, what did I say? Uh, thank you. Uh, drink more coffee. Uh, compact and, you're right, and comic. If I was a smarter instructor, I would have said I was testing you. Uh, but that was not the case. Uh, I made a mistake. While I was writing that, I was thinking something else. That's, that sometimes happens. So, uh, be, so I want this to be a correspondence, so not a function. Again, you see, a correspondence, I'll use this notation. And when I say be, uh, well, let me write it first, non-empty. valued correspondence, okay? So when I say correspondence, you can think of it as a function from S into the subsets of S, okay? So you want to use this notation, but say correspondence is not a function. It doesn't take values in S to values in S. It takes values in S to subsets of S. Okay, be a non-empty valued correspondence. Well, I want to add one more condition here, so let me write. Be a non-empty and convex non-empty and convex valued correspondence. Uh, let's erase this part. Graph. So what do I mean by a closed graph? What I mean is the following. Okay. The set of all st in S cross S such that T is an element of F of S is a closed set. That's what I mean by a closed graph, okay? Which is a closed graph. Then there exists an S star in capital S such that S star is an element of F of S. We call S star a fixed point of the correspondence F. By the way, if f was single valued, if it was a function, this would essentially mean f of s star is equal to s star. Okay, so the word, the phrase fixed point makes more sense when you have a function rather than a correspondence, okay? So that's Kakutani's fixed point theorem, and we use it in economics in several places. And one place that we use it is in proving the existence of a Nash solution, okay? So, how do we prove it? We have 10 minutes, so we still can do something. First, if we're going to use Kakutani's fixed point theorem, which I've already given you a hint about that, we should have a proper correspondence. But to have the correspondence, you first need a domain. So what would you take the domain to be in your proof? Set of strategy profiles, right? That's the most natural thing to do. That's actually why I chose the letter S. Normally, I would write it with X, OK? So we, uh, in proving the Nash existence theorem, we would let S in the Kakutani's theorem, Kakutani's fixed point theorem, be the set of all strategy profiles. 
So the next thing we should do is choose a proper f, a correspondence, okay, for which the fixed point of that correspondence and and what is related? Uh, the fixed point is related, well, hopefully they will all be related with best responses, but eventually, what do we want to show? We want to show the existence of a Nash solution, right? So we would like to relate the fixed point okay, of F with the Nash solution of the game, gamma, the Calcutanis fixed point theorem says that. There exists a fixed point. What do we want to prove? There exists a Nash solution. So in order to relate that, what should we choose F to be? What should we choose F to be? Any ideas? By the way, is the attendance sheet going around? What should we, what should we choose F to be? So let's make a wild guess. You know, making mistakes is okay. Yes, sir. Choose. Let's let's go step by. So you want to choose the correspondence F to be the Nash solution concept, right? After all, we can, you know, that's a. So what does the Nash solution concept take as an argument? Sorry? A game. It takes a game. What does it yield? It yields a strategy profile. Well, what we want is the domain and the range to be the same. That's one problem. The other thing is, in the Nash existence theorem, the game is fixed. We have a single game. But when you think about you know, F here, the arguments of F keeps changing. Here, gamma is fixed. It doesn't change. There's only one game at hand. Yes, sir? Should we apply what? Okay, so that's what we want to, so we want to use the Calcutta's fixed point theorem, but you have a suggestion, so we're looking at what F should be. So your suggestion is F should be the best response, the best response correspondence. The problem is we have many of them. Each agent has a best response correspondence, BI. So which one should we take? To apply the theorem to each one. So for each one, apply the theorem and get a result. But that's not the only problem. So there's many, you know, there's a player one has a best response correspondence, player two, player three. Which one should be used for F? Your friend has a nice suggestion. Apply the Calcutta's theorem n times. Okay, and then we'll probably have some way to mix it. But then there's another problem. What is the domain of BI? It takes the strategy profiles of the other agents as given, and the range is. Yes, but for the Calcutta's theorem to work, the domain and the range should be the same. But before somebody else, yes. Okay. So, what do you have? I'll get the same thing. Exactly. So the same idea, but stated in a more technical, more mathematical way. So what your friends do is define a correspondence B. So let's drop the I from the set of strategy profiles to the set of strategy profiles, which is defined in the following way for any strategy profile S, B of S is equal to the Cartesian product of BI of S minus I, where I runs over. 
Okay. Okay. So this is a subset of SI. So the Cartesian product is a subset of S. So this is a function from S, not a function, a correspondence from S to S. It takes a strategy profile and picks a subset of the strategy profiles. So far so good? So far so good? So this looks, so actually let me do a little graphical illustration with that. Uh, so again, let's take a very simple case because, you know, in that case I can draw the picture. A two diamond two player. Each strategy set is a subset of the one dimensional Euclidean space. So So this is the graph of the best response correspondence of player one. And I don't know, let me take it simpler. This is the graph of the best response correspondence of player two. So we take a point S in the domain in, uh, of B. So for example, we take this point. If this is our point S, well, the best responses for player one, so that's S1, S2. So this is, actually, let me put a prime here, S2 prime. So this is B1 of S1 prime. And then this is B2 of S1 prime. So take the Cartesian product of those. It would be this set. So this point is mapped to this rectangular region. That's our correspondence. That's how it works. Takes a strategy profile, maps it to a set of strategy profiles. OK? So far, so good? Let me draw one more picture. This time, try to make it nicer. And then we'll take a break. So nice compact convex set. I will not shade the inside. So this is the inside is B1. Let me keep it simple. The inside is B2. So let me take a point S double prime here. So S1 double prime. S2 double prime. So the best response of player one to S2, S2 double prime is any strategy in this region. So I should project it here, but I'll keep it there. The best response of player two to S1 double prime is any strategy in this region. So the Cartesian product of those two would be this region. And what do you see? S double prime is an element of B of S double prime. So this point is a fixed point of this correspondence. Not only this point, so is this point. Okay. But this point is not. Neither is this, nor this. The only fixed points of this correspondence will be the points where? Where? Where the best response correspondences overlap, okay, intersect on the graph. Which means that the only best, the only fixed points of this 
would be, this correspondence would be the Nash solutions of the game. Okay? But of course, that's graphical. So we'll prove. Well, so what we have to do is, well, we define the correspondence. We have to make sure that our correspondence satisfies all the conditions of Kakutani's fixed point theorem. And we have to show that a fixed point of this correspondence is actually a Nash solution. But let's take a 10 minute break. After the break, we'll do the proof.